This is A New Angle, a show about cool people doing awesome things in and around Montana. I'm your host, Justin Angle. This show is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Hey folks, welcome back and thanks for tuning in. Today I'm speaking with Craig Cowie, professor at the University of Montana's Blewett School of Law. You know, we think about the Supreme Court as arbiters of the law, sort of saying what the law is at the highest level. We don't think about them as arbiters of fact. Craig's going to guide us through three of the most significant decisions in this recently concluded term of the United States Supreme Court. Craig, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Justin. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, since you've been on the show before, we can dispense with the bio stuff and get right into it because we've got a lot to cover. Historic term at the court this uh, this year. Absolutely. And, you know, so much happened that we can only really scratch the surface here. And so let's get to it. Yeah. So let's start with Dobbs. What happened okay. in the Dobbs case? Because that was kind of the one that grabbed the most headlines. Sure. So before we talk about Dobbs, I think it makes sense to talk a little bit about sort of our federal state system, because not everybody understands exactly how the different, like, what does it mean for a federal constitution versus a state constitution? Okay. So- our U.S. Constitution is supreme, and things that are in the U.S. Constitution, a state constitution or a Congress or a state legislature, they can't pass laws or have rules that conflict mm -hmm. with the U.S. Constitution. Below that, if Congress passes a law, that's going to trump a state law or a state constitution. Okay. When you get to the states, a state constitution might is going to trump a state law. But that's the sort of basic framework. And so with Dobbs, if we go back to the early 70s when the court issued Roe v. Wade, which uh -huh. is the case everybody's 1973? Yes. Right. And so in that case, what the court said was that people had a right to choose an abortion that could be weighed against government interests. So you didn't have an absolute right, but mm -hmm. you had a right to it under certain circumstances. That right could not be infringed upon. Roe was modified over the years, but the ba that basic rule still existed was that you got you had to weigh the state's interest in limiting abortion, how much burden that was going to place on the person's right to choose the medical procedure of okay. abortion. Okay. So with Dobbs, the court revisited Roe and all of its subsequent cases and said that the U.S. Constitution, in fact, did not protect the right to an abortion okay. under any circumstances. Okay. In that case, Mississippi had passed a law that limited abortion after 15 after weeks. After 15 weeks. Right. And so that was a limitation that would have to be weighed against the, the woman's constitutional right mm -hmm. under the Roe and its the successor cases there. But now after Dobbs... That right doesn't exist anymore. So the states can now step in and actually regulate. Regulate abortion. as they say fit. As, they, as say. they say fit. That's right. And so this doesn't mean, to be clear, the Supreme Court's not saying that abortion, at least not in this case, is not saying that abortion is unconstitutional, mm -hmm. but rather it's a question of who gets to decide the before. States. Right. Now the woman doesn't have that right and the state can decide if it wants. So what does this mean for Montana? We've got a constitution and some case law that speaks specifically to not necessarily abortion, but medical autonomy, is that, or bodily autonomy? That's right, right. So Montana's constitution has in Article 2, Section 10, a fantastic explicit protection of privacy okay. for its citizens. And that's something that's, that's, it's not unique to Montana, but Montana has a really strong protection. There was a case in 1999 called Armstrong v. State, where the Montana Supreme Court said that that right to privacy in the Montana Constitution included a right to make medical choices for yourself, and specifically the right to what they called procreative autonomy. In other okay. words, the right to choose when to have I mean, that children. seems as close to mentioning abortion in, 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 a, in case law as, as it gets? Yes. In the case, it's explicit. Okay. Right? So we, we, we in Montana still have, that case is still good law. Mm -hmm. So now Roe has been stricken. 
And so there's no longer a federal constitutional right to an abortion. So but a in state Montana, is no longer subservient to some federal right to abortion. Now the state is – we can do what we want here. And what we've done so far is the state constitution protects sure. a woman's right to choose in Montana. So that's because our constitution says it and our courts have interpreted it that way. Sure. And our legislature meets once every other year, right? So. <laughs> right. Well, although there are there are some laws, you know, that's the thing is under our system, the state legislators can't pass a law that conflicts with the state constitution. Okay. So they've passed laws, but they've been stricken or enjoined because they conflicted either in the past with the federal constitution, but also in Armstrong, we have our own right under our own constitution, which is an independent ground. So is that the only mechanism through which abortion be, could become illegal in the state of Montana is, is a constitutional amendment or, I mean, there's some talk of throwing out the constitution and having a new convention. Are those the mechanisms? So those are some of the mechanisms. Okay. There are five ways basically that this could change. So the first way is that the Montana Supreme Court itself could change its mind Okay, so a case what, comes up to the Montana court. That's right. And they decide that the court itself was wrong in Armstrong v. State, and it changes its interpretation of the Montana Constitution. That's basically what happened in the federal sure. Supreme yeah, Court. Yeah, sounds you know, similar. The, so, and that, you know, that's a question of who's on the court. And, you know, we have two justices running for re-election right now, both in challenged races. And this issue has already come up in the press. And sure. This is where people are like, well, if you want to change the rule on abortion, you know, vote this way or vote that way. And if the court changes, or it could just decide without a personnel change, it could decide that it made a mistake. The amendment is, a, is the second way, which is what you said, which is that Montana itself could choose to amend its constitution mm -hmm. to make clear that that right to procreative autonomy is not included. Okay. And there it would be either two thirds of the legislatures of legislators for both houses could propose something to be voted on by the people or a very sort of complicated scheme, but like basically 10% of the electorate, including 10% of two fifths of the legislative <laughs> okay, districts, right? Could, could also propose to put something, but the end result is that either way, p the people of Montana would vote on whether or not to, to amend the constitution. Okay, so, so interesting upcoming legislative sessions, yes. these elections, <laughs> a lot of consequential right. things in the next 12 months in the state of Montana. Right. So that's that's just two of the ways. Though. Oh, right, 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 right. right. Because, so the other thing is, remember in our scheme, if Congress passes a law, that can trump state law sure. too. Now, right now, Congress is, is, you know, there's been discussion of whether or not Congress is going to pass a law that will protect the mm -hmm. right to abortion, but Congress could also pass a law that uh, eliminated bans it. Yep, it bans it and exactly. And so, if that law were upheld, that law would trump state our law. law in the states. Yeah, so that could happen. The other thing is that the U.S. Supreme Court could decide in a new case mm. that abortion is affirmatively unconstitutional. Okay, you see some of that in the Dobbs opinion because there's some discussion of well, the fetus actually has a right not to be aborted. Mm -hmm. And if the court said that there were, that was a constitutional right, then that would eliminate, you know, abortion in every state. Sure. Everywhere all the And then that's the law of the entire that's nation. Right. And, and, you know, the fifth way is that Montana Supreme Court, although it doesn't seem likely currently, but like they could decide this, they could also decide that. Sure. And, a case and comes to them. Right. Yep. Talk a little bit about this, um, Concurring opinion from Thomas, sort of inviting implications for yeah. other, other, you know, other rights. I guess right, right to marry, right to contraception, and so forth. Absolutely. So, really, the two big overarching issues coming out of this case are like the effect on people's right to choose, but also what does this mean for other rights? And okay. Justice, as you noted, Justice Thomas in his concurrence actually explicitly says calls into question the legality of the right to conception from a case called Griswold, the right to be sort of not prosecuted for same-sex sexual conduct, which was Lawrence v. Texas, mm -hmm. the right to uh, marry under Obergefell. Each one of those cases is rooted in the same idea of privacy, or as I think Dahlia Lithwick, I think, phrases this very nicely, the post-slavery, post-Civil War context when we enacted the 14th Amendment, this idea of bodily auto autonomy. Like slavery was a situation where you didn't have the right 
to control your body or your children or who you married. And that when we pass these statutes, what we're really doing is countering that, this right to bodily autonomy. So all of these other rights are also rooted in the same thing. They were thing. reasoned in the same. Right. Yep, yep, and, okay. and based on the same part of the Constitution that the court just said was egregiously wrong. So the Dobbs majority, to be clear, says very clearly that this is all about abortion. Abortion is different. But Justice Thomas is part of that majority. And he's very clear that at least for him, it's not different. So those other rights are also, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. Okay. So let's move on to Castro Huerta. Tell us about that case. This, this is an Indian law case. Okay. And federal Indian law is extremely complicated, yeah. um, including about the issue about who has the right to prosecute crimes within what's called Indian country. Mm -hmm. And that can depend on the people involved, the type of crime, the exact nature of the property on which the crime happened. So we're going to just touch on this at a, at a high level. Sure. And I think it's important for people to understand just at, at as a basic, you know, tribes are unique in our structure. They're not states. Sometimes people confuse them and think that they're like states. They're independent sovereigns that worked with the federal government, went to war against the federal government, sure. negotiated treaties. This was basically all at the federal tribal level. And the U.S. Constitution allows Congress to pass laws that affect tribes and their members, even on their own land. But states generally you know, like so the state of Montana or the state of Oklahoma, they can't do that. They're not allowed generally to exert authority, or at least they weren't, mm -hmm. uh, over tribes and tribal members within the confines of the reservations. And this case really starts almost 200 years ago okay. in a case called Worcester v. Georgia, which was from 1832. So in, I think, the 1820s, gold was discovered in Cherokee country. Georgia, which at the time was was within sort of in part of Georgia. They weren't part of it, but, you know, it was in the same geographic Different area. state boundaries. Yeah. yeah. So Georgia then passed a law that basically seized all of Cherokee country and- To get the gold. Uh, right. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to say why they did it, but <laughs> okay. uh, but yeah, they see the, what the law did was sort of, sort of basically just seized the whole thing and asserted that Georgia's criminal laws applied throughout Cherokee territory. Okay. Yep. And the Supreme Court at the time squarely rebuffed hmm. Georgia. And the, I just want to uh, uh, read a quote because I think it's important. And this is in 1832. The court says, the Indian nations had always been considered as distinct, independent political communities, retaining their original natural rights as the undisputed possessors of the soil from time immemorial. Right? So this is a very strong statement of tribal sovereignty and tribal sovereign authority. And so the rule for about the past 200 years since that case was for purposes of, of Castro Huerta, the case, the case we're going to talk about today, was that states could not prosecute crimes involving tribal members that occurred within Indian country okay. unless they were allowed to do so under federal law, which usually meant that Congress had passed a law to allow them to do that. In 2020, when Justice Ginsburg was still on the court, the court heard a case called McGirt. Mm -hmm. And in that case, it the court held that only Congress could, the technical term is disestablish a reservation, but that means to, to narrow it or eliminate it. And that it hadn't in this case with respect to the Muskegee um, Creek Nation reservation. And so as a practical result, portions of Oklahoma, including much of Tulsa, we're, we're now part of Indian country. Okay. And the court specifically in McGirt discussed this issue, the fact that this could change who has the right to prosecute crimes in this territory and that maybe they, they would have to adjust staffing for it. And this is a five to four decision. So five justices voted for it, including Justice Ginsburg. In a, in this opinion, back in 2020. Right, in yep. 2020. Authored in the opinions authored by Justice Gorsuch. Mm -hmm. So um, as... I'm sure you and your listeners know Justice Ginsburg has since passed away, was replaced by um, Justice Barrett. And this term we get Oklahoma v. Castro Huerta. This is also a 5-4 decision, but this time the majority from McGirt, they're now in the dissent. Sure. So they're in the minority. So they've lost. And here, Oklahoma wanted to, pr to prosecute 
Castro Huerta, who is not an Indian, for alleged crimes against his stepdaughter, who was a tribal member. In the case, the court is actually asked to overturn McGirt and says, no, we're not doing that. But it does hold that Castro Huerta can be prosecuted by the state because the Congress had not taken away what the what the court calls the state's inherent authority to prosecute crimes, quote, within its territory, mm. unquote. So this is a complete flip on the presumptions that I was just talking about. That date back 200 years. Exactly. So right there, so prior to Castro Huerta, the rule was states do not have authority unless granted it, specifically by Congress. Now the rule is states have authority unless it is preempted by either Congress or preempted by a threat to tribal self-governance. And in this case, the court says neither of those things prevents Oklahoma from prosecuting Mr. Castro Huerta. So this, practically speaking, kind of really threatens the concept of tribal sovereignty. I think that's right. Now, the case itself is is limited to the facts that we've talked about, right? So it's about whether or not you can prosecute. But I think the implications are quite broad and possibly devastating to tribal sovereign authority. Justice Kavanaugh wrote the majority in Castro Huerta. He basically gives, his analysis gives no weight uh, to concepts of tribal sovereignty, he basically dispenses with their concerns in two paragraphs and says that, you know, well, not taking anything away from the tribe by allowing the state to prosecute too, because the tribe itself could prosecute. And importantly, you know, states, there's a long history of states trying to exert their influence into sure. reservations and so forth. And this sort of structuring, especially that use of the phrase within its territories to describe the state, suggests that the state sort of overlaps the the Indian country and the reservation. So now that the reservation is somehow subject to. And so I think there's a lot of concern about what not necessarily will happen after this case, but what will happen in other areas sure. related, will the state try to exert its influence in other ways, pass laws that try that, that claim to govern what's what tribal members do on tribal land, or whether or not you can you know allow tribal members to be sued in state courts instead of in tribal courts, which is the rule that exists right now. It was interesting because ordinarily we, we think about cases as applying on their facts, right? Mm -hmm. You've got a set factual scenario and that's what you're, you're answering that question. But Justice Kavanaugh rebuffs that in his majority and says, no, this applies uh, across the country. In other words, that's all states, all tribes, with no consideration for the fact that every tribe has a unique relationship with the unique history, set of sets theory, of treaties. Set of treaties exactly. History, yeah. All of that. And he just sort of dispenses with all of that. And he does this sort of hand, you know, sleight of hand where he's like, well, we moved away from that idea of Worcester v. Georgia long ago. So we don't need to follow it now. So I think that's a that's going to be one that's really important to watch and see how it develops. Yeah, and a lot of implications for Montana Ab too. Absolutely. Plenty of Indian country here. Yeah. We'll be back to our conversation with Craig Cowie after this short break. A New Angle is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and UM's College of Business. Access to capital, broadband, and education are three ingredients any community needs for success. This is Mike Morelli, Executive Director at MCT, and you are listening to A New Angle. Welcome back to A New Angle. I'm speaking with Craig Cowie about the U.S. Supreme Court. We got time for one more. One more. All right. <laughs> Let's so, talk about West Virginia versus EPA, because that's a big one with, with also implications for Montana. So Congress uh, enacted the Clean Air Act back in the 70s, mm -hmm. which directed, among other things, directed the EPA to regulate emissions of pollutants, right? And in this case, the pollutant in question is carbon dioxide, and the EPA is generally supposed to look at all polluting sources. In this case, it's existing coal and natural gas power plants. And so what the EPA does 
is it sets a limit of emissions. So okay. how much carbon dioxide can be emitted. Sure. And it does so based on the best system. Let's just be careful. The act does not set that limit. The agency- That's right. Which is derived from that act sets the limit. And the, the act gives the agency that authority. That's right. And so that here, the goal is regulate emissions. So we have cleaner air. And in this case, the rule was we're going to set, in fact, this statute actually says set a limit. And so then the agency goes through a process that you noted, an administrative process to determine what that limit should be. Okay. And in this case, they decided the limit in part by, by assuming uh, that companies could shift the way in which they produce power in order to lower their emissions. So one thing you could do is like, you could just say, oh, I'm going to clean the emissions as they come out of the plant. Yep. Right? You just put a device on the plant that stops sure. CO2 from going Keep into doing the, the same thing, but make it cleaner. Exactly. Or you could maybe do something different, produce mm -hmm. the energy a different way that produced fewer pollutants and thereby meet your goal. So that was a rule that was propounded by the Obama administration, EPA. The Supreme Court stopped it immediately. Then when Trump comes into power, his EPA rescinds that rule which had already been stopped. It had already been stopped. As you said. And then issues a new rule. Okay. That rule is then challenged. Okay. The DC Circuit, which is a, a federal court of appeals in the District of Columbia that deals a, a lot with administrative issues, they vacate both actions by the Trump EPA. So they say you were wrong when you rescinded the rule, you didn't follow the right procedures, and you were wrong when you promulgated your rule, you didn't follow the right procedures, send it back think again. So right now, when West Virginia v. EPA starts, there's no rule in effect. Right, because those two actions have been vacated. Right. And, and, and the first one never went into effect. Mm -hmm. In fact, President Biden says, we're not going to do that. The argument that, that the court makes is that because we think that there's nothing to stop the Biden administration from go ahead and setting its new limits using the same the same idea that you can change the way you produce energy. Okay. And because they might do that, we're just going to go ahead and rule on it and in fact say that they can't the EPA does not have that. So that West Virginia and whatever adjoining states mm -hmm. sued the EPA saying like we're worried that you might regulate us. Yes, with you might do the same thing that the Biden EPA so did. So there was no so action that they were contesting, it was just like we're scared of this threat right. so we're going to sue. And that's what the court says is that in fact the Biden EPA was wrong. EPA doesn't have that power. And this is a real interesting rationale because it uses for the first time by name, a doctrine called the major questions. Major doctrine. questions, okay. Right. And this idea is that some things are too big and too new. So if Congress wants an agency to do them, we're going to make Congress spell that out explicitly. And the dissent is pretty strong that they feel, or that Justice Kagan wrote the dissent, is joined by several other justices, but she's like, this is the EPA's wheelhouse, right? right. right? They, they regulate emissions. This creates a lot of uncertainty. And so interestingly, you know, one of the things that I didn't mention was that through the market forces, right, while all this fighting was going on, companies just went ahead and changed their generation of power in a way that actually met all the goals that the Obama rule had laid out. This has already happened. It just, it creates a lot of inefficiency and concern. And that's a real concern long-term, especially given that the same rule applies. It's not just the EPA, but it, really any agency needs to look at this case and be, you know, I think every agency's general counsel's office is going to have read this case, really digest it and be like, how does this affect what we do? Is there anything that we've done that could be considered a major question? And do we need to think twice about that? So lots of uncertainty across the board for all. So the agencies that govern banking sure. that govern consumer protection, communications, communications all, of it. all of it. Yeah. Mm. Well, Craig, a lot to digest here. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Any kind of broad commentary uh, on the court in general, where it's going, et cetera, or um, yeah, thoughts well, there? Sure. So where it's going is always a bit of the tea leaves. So mm -hmm. I'll, stay, I'll stay away from that because I'm okay. not sure. But I will note that something that I saw, and I'm not the only one, there's been a lot of discussion about this, but throughout this term was that the court's really using 
a lot of historical analysis in its opinions and baking that historical analysis into the reasoning. And that seems like, okay, well, what's the big deal? But I'll just note in in deference to my historian colleagues here at the the campus is that history is its own profession. And those people, historians, they spend their lives grappling with those methods and understanding what's the, how do we interpret things? How do we read contested facts and histories and so forth? They're experts at history. And the Supreme Court just isn't. They're not historians. They don't have that training, and nor, nor do most lawyers. So a little bit of history, sure, we can look at that. We can look at what happened in prior cases. But really delving into complicated questions about what the country was, issues the country was engaged with at a long ago time, that's something that we need to rely on other experts sure. for. And that's something that I'm seeing a little bit. I think the court's sort of straying outside of its lane in a way that it doesn't have the skills to do this, you know, they can make, have a false understanding of the history that can then affect the way their legal analysis and lead to maybe not the best result. Um, We saw a lot of that in Dobbs, but also in Brune, the case of the Second Amendment, historians have actually spoken out publicly against the reasoning in both cases so far. The other thing I'd just note is that, you know, we think about the Supreme Court as arbiters of the law, sort of saying what the law is at the highest level. We don't think about them as arbiters of fact. In other words, what are the facts? And when we think about it, you know, courts exist in a sort of a, a like a food pyramid hierarchy is sort of thing everybody can remember from grade school. And with the Supreme Court on top, farthest away from the factual record and and trial courts and juries at the bottom. They're the ones who are really in the weeds on what's happening in this case. So when a court that's higher up looks down and it doesn't have all the facts, especially if there's a disputed fact, typically our rules say those disputed fact questions, if they're material to the legal question, they go to the jury. And when we've got that, then we can apply our legal analysis to those facts as we now, sure. as the jury has decided they're they should stipulated. Be. Exactly. But we sort of see the court either stepping in and, and taking cases when there's no factual record at all, in which case they might, you know, hypothesize about what the facts might be, but they don't have an actual record of what the facts are. And there's been a history of that over the past few years increasing. Or they decide, they go and they say, well, I'm going to decide that the the fact is X, while the dissent is saying, well, the fact is not X. And that's just not a situation I, I don't think we want the courts to be in as a society. Yeah, that seems like a problem. Craig, we covered a lot of ground <laughs> yes. today, and it sounds like you've got a lot of fodder for some interesting classes with your students this fall semester. So Yes, I'm um, looking forward to it. Indeed. Thank you for spending your time with us, sharing your expertise, and we'll see you down the road. Great. Thank you for having me, Justin. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, a generous gift from UM alums Michelle and Lauren Hansen. A New Angle is presented by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. With additional support from Consolidated Electrical Distributors, Drum Coffee, and Montana Public Radio. Keely Larson is our producer. VTO, Jeff Amet, and John Wicks made our music. Editing by Nick Mott, social media by AJ Williams, and Jeff Neese is our master of all things sound. Thanks a lot, and see you next time.